Terra incognita speculative fiction. Terra incognita speculative fiction. Welcome to this month's Terra Incognita Australian Speculative Fiction Podcast. I'm your host, Keith Stevenson. Put simply, Terra Incognita is the best Australian speculative fiction read by the authors who created it. And please visit tisf.com.au for links to our featured authors' website and publications. This month's writer is Lee Battersby, who's won most of the Specfic Awards in Australia and has a swag of stories published here and overseas, including a collection, Through Soft Air, published by Prime Books. One of Lee's most enduring and continuing characters, Father Muerti, has appeared in four stories to date and is the subject of his story for TISF, Father Muerti and the Flesh. So come with us now to Costa Satanis, home of Father Muerti, and a number of peculiarly quaint inhabitants spending their days in that idyllic holiday destination nestling somewhere that doesn't appear on any map you've ever seen. There are very few completely true things in Costa Satanis. Of those that are, Perhaps the truest is that it is impossible to climb to the summit of Point Arrival, the bony finger of land pointing out into the ocean at the west end of town, or the east, depending upon where you look and who you are when you're looking. Any number of theories have abounded over the years to explain its isolation, from geological anomalies to one involving the body of an ancient giant and the curse of a jealous lover. That one's my favourite, possibly because it comes closest to the truth. Today, however, point arrivals or remoteness stems from an entirely different source, one more mundane than anyone would suspect. Sometimes, I like to be alone. Slightly winded by the long hike up the hillside, I laid out my picnic blanket, unwrapped a cheese and jam sandwich, and took a bite. I sat, and with my face to the ocean breeze, uncorked my thermos. The smell of Benito D'Amico's special macchiato blend rose into the air, mixing with the sea current and wafting toward the front beach. As the molecules combined, I saw the sunburn addicts wrap towels around themselves and walk up the beach to deposit sand onto Benito's suede-covered wicker chairs. The first sip of Benito's coffee is a solemn ritual, a meaningful one despite its ordinary accoutrements. I take great pains to make sure I am never, ever interrupted. This made the woman's arrival all the more incredible, and all the more annoying. Phew, she said, wiping her forehead with a bandana wrapped around one brown wrist like a sweatband. That's some climb. She rounded the last lip of rock and planted herself opposite me as if it were the most natural thing in the world. It's meant to be. My cup was not yet halfway to my expectant lips. I placed it back on the blanket. Pardon my asking, but how did you get up here? She favoured me with a look that questioned my sanity in a gentle way. I walked. Don't tell me there's a bus service I could have taken. No, it's just... This place is private. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't realise. The photographer said... This is yours? In a manner of speaking, I sighed. This photographer... Young man, black, carries an odd-looking camera. That's him. She smiled, and I decided not to notice what a lovely smile she had. He said I'd like the view. I bet he did. Henri Anglomar suffers a terminal inability to remain single. He wishes to inflict his curse upon me, one of the reasons I found myself climbing the point more and more often in recent times. But one of these days I shall have to introduce him to the meaning of privacy. I'm sorry. Hey, are you that priest everyone talks about? I keep telling them I'm not a priest. No, you don't look like one. Is that coffee? May I? I'd kill for a good coffee. Here. I handed her the cup and passed the thermos behind it. It lost its taste. She drew deeply on the brew, then sprawled backwards into the grass, a moan of pleasure escaping her parted lips. I busied myself in folding the blanket, ignoring her long legs as I slid its edge from underneath them. I left the sandwiches to the circling gulls. 
The intruder looked back up at me as I busied myself, then slowly rose to her feet, screwed the cup back onto the thermos and handed it to me with an air of regret. No taste, she said to the circling clouds. You, sir, have been spoiled. I smiled despite my annoyance, and she stuck out a slim hand. Bonnie Craig. I shook it. Her skin was soft, with just a hint of callus where tools had suffered years of grip. Her shake was firm, decisive. Well, Miss Craig, I indicated the path she would never have found without me. Would you care to share the journey back to town? We were halfway along the beach when I spied a group of children gathered around a large, indistinct lump on the sand. I moved toward it, Bonnie in my wake. What is it? A body? The group parted as we drew near. I knelt by the slab, running my hand over the mass of matter. It was cold, despite the mid-afternoon heat, and bore no resemblance to anything I could remember having seen. Not a body, Bonnie said as she knelt beside me and reached out a tentative hand. It's flesh, though. Yes. I kneaded a small piece between finger and thumb while the children screwed up their faces and chorused a squeal of disgust. I pointed to one. Kaylee, run and fetch Henri for me, will you? He'll be at Benito's. Yes, Papa. She set off at a self-important trot. I turned back to Bonnie. I'd say this is a globster. A whatster? Globster. They float up onto beaches every now and again. Scientists think they might be pieces of giant squids attacked by sperm whales. I smiled at her over the bulbous mound of flesh. Or might not. Henri should be able to tell us. He's a scientist? Not quite. Henri's father had been a football manager in his native Cameroon, and a firm follower of tribal superstitions. His son had grown up with the ability to sense animals, a skill he'd blocked until it had donated our little mystery, before we carted it away. Within a minute he was loping up the sand behind Kaylee, a smile of triumph plastered across his deliberately innocent face. I reached into my jacket pocket and removed a stick of Blackpool rock. Kaylee received it as due reward. As she skipped away, I spied Henri and Bonnie with their heads together. Told you so, he was saying. They straightened up when they saw my glance. I frowned in puzzlement, and at the giggle Bonnie gave in return, I placed a hand on the lump. Any ideas? Henri knelt, then leaned forward and pressed his face against the cool, slippery flesh. After a minute or so, in which I ignored the pretty young woman's questioning looks, he tilted back and glanced up at me. Nothing. Whatever this is, it isn't animal. What is it, then? Bonnie looked between us. I reached into a jacket pocket and withdrew a scalpel and test tube. That is what I intend to find out. I have, over the course of what other people would consider a number of lifetimes, accumulated knowledge in a variety of areas. Some of it is more practical than others. How to use a microscope, for example. Even so, I had to triple check before I believed the evidence presented to me by the eyepiece. It's human. What? Henri leaned forward on his stool. Are you sure? I wish I wasn't. But how? Bonnie had perched upon the edge of a bench. She jumped off and elbowed me out of the way, peering into the microscope with professional ease. That man must be four feet long. There are no bones, no framework. She turned the focus, lapsed into silence then. Shit, you're right. Undeniably human. She glanced up into our inquiring stares. Sorry, forgot to mention. Forensic pathologist. Henri laughed. Oh, nice one. Really nice, eh, father? Bonnie chuckled. To cover my consternation, I lifted the slide from the microscope and carried it across to the bench I used for my more unusual investigations. I mixed together some basil, a little shaved mandrake, and some milk from a nursing white whale. I crushed the skull of a long extinct mammal into the mix, then scooped a finger through it and spread a blob across a slice of the flesh, chanting a language known only to myself and three monks in Tibet. Should he be doing stuff like that? Bonnie whispered. He's not exactly a priest. Henri replied. I smiled. I might be getting through to people. I placed the sliver of flesh onto a fresh slide and slid it back under the microscope. So, Henri asked as I bent to the eyepiece, is it still human? The mixture on the slide spelled out the owner of the flesh in a pattern I could not mistake. I stared at it, refusing to allow the shock of recognition to reach my voice. It's more than that, I told him. It's someone we know. 
Costa Satanus has many fascinating features, not least of which is its topography. If you can navigate a tesseract, and you know where to look, you can travel the length of the entire town in little more than a few steps. I had been banging on the front door of Mama Casson's Hotel Quixote for over three minutes before Henri and Bonnie staggered around the corner at the far end of the street. One of these days, Henri gasped as they reached me, you're going to have to introduce me to a map of this place. It's locked, I indicated the entrance. There's no answer. Locked? Mama C locked the hotel door? We exchanged worried frowns. Mama Casson never closed the Quixote. Time of day is no impediment to parting a tourist from their cash. If that really was her on the beach, she may not have been the one who did. You don't think it was her, do you? I stopped to consider the mass of flesh we'd carried up the beach to the cooler room at Benito's. Mama is one of my earliest residents, and one of my oldest friends. If it is her, I shall never stop taking revenge on whoever did such a thing to her. But it can't be, surely. I pulled out my lock-picking gear from inside my jacket. There's only one way to find out. Excuse me. Bonnie moved past us and reached into her purse. She pulled out a key, inserted it, and opened the entry. After you. A key? Henri Stage whispered as we entered the darkened hallway. I'm surprised as you are, I replied. I couldn't recall Mama Casson using a normal key, and I've been here longer than the town. We stopped creeping halfway down the hall outside Mama's apartment. The door was closed. I knocked. Mama? No answer came from within. I knocked louder and called her name once more. Still, she made no reply. Henri made to grab the doorknob and I stopped his hand. I wouldn't do that just yet. Mama Casson was driven from her homeland for being a witch. She wasn't. Not entirely. But her knowledge of arcane matters outstripped my own in many places. Protection charms were something she could do in her sleep. A scent in the deadened air of the corridor teased at my memory. Mothers? I looked at the others in surprise. Why would she be afraid of mothers? You've obviously not met mine. I smiled at Henri's nervous joke. Okay, you can open it. He turned the knob and the door swung open on silent hinges. The air inside smelt clean and altogether wrong for a woman who spent every spare moment huddled all over pot, saucepan and cauldron. I traded glances with Henri, moved inside and reached for the light switch. What the hell? Henri stepped past me. The last time either of us was here, the room had been scaffolded by shelving. Books and ornaments from a thousand travels leaned together in joyful chaos. Now it was all gone and in its place. It's a shrine. Did she mention anything to you? No. I took a step forward. No, she didn't. But you're her priest. I keep telling you. I reached the far corner and bent to examine the memorial. Oh, no. What is it? Bonnie's voice reached us from the doorway. We turned towards her and she gestured at the room helplessly. Is it? You can come in. I, uh, I have a son. Ah, wait a moment. I pulled a medallion from a jacket pocket, walked over and placed it round her neck. Saint Anne, I explained. Patron saint, you should be fine now. I took her hand and led her inside, ignoring Henri's intentionally guileless face. Bonnie took one look at the picture forming the shrine's backdrop and gasped. Holy mother, she whispered. Mattress of Templar, Mattress nos defides, sebra quod indulgiones doth vos dequium satid god pressione vos. What? What did she say? I don't know, I replied. It's a prayer, Bonnie told us, to the Holy Mother Joan. You recognize her? Bonnie smiled. Catholic girls' school. We had to hear I worship somebody. Anybody fancy cluing me in? Henri raised his eyebrows in mock encouragement. I indicated the cheap print. It's a picture of a statue, which once adorned the Nedicola and the Vicus Papisa in Rome. The what is? Street of the Woman Pope, Bonnie translated. Woman Pope. Pope Joan. As I spoke her name, the woman in the portrait turned her head and regarded me with a look both calculating and watchful. Bonnie took a step backwards. 
I reached out a hand to stop her. Now would not be the time to run. She stood rigid. I did my best not to recognize the warmth beneath her trembling skin. She reigned as Pope Joan the Eighth during the ninth century, disguised as a man, but she fell in love with a junior bishop on the papal staff. When she gave birth while journeying along the Vicus Papisa, they hanged her, along with her baby and lover. I regarded the print. The likeness does not do her justice. The picture opened its mouth, and a voice like ancient sand filled the room. Where is he? Where is who? Bonnie whispered. Where is he? The voice became more strident, angrier. The eyes fixed upon me, and grew wide as recognition distorted its features. You! How could you! Run! I pushed my two companions toward the exit. Ripping sounds filled the room behind us, and a scream of rage. We bundled into the hallway. I slammed the door, catching a glimpse of the ruined shrine, and the creature half emerged from it as I did so. The medallion! Quickly! I pointed to the ornament dangling from Bonnie's throat. She tore it off and flung it to me. I wrapped it round the doorknob and spat on it three times, murmuring a chant in black Aramaic. She's a pope, I explained as I herded them out of the building. Mother to a whole cult. Reversing the charm might hold her for a while. Catholicism is hardly a cult. All religions are cults, I set off down the street. Some priest, Bonnie muttered as they fell in behind me. He's not a priest, Henri replied, but I was too lost in thought to take any pleasure in his denial. So where are we going? I'm not just leaving her there, surely. I looked back at the hotel. I thought never to revisit the pain that suddenly encircled my throat. No, I replied. We're going to seek psychiatric help. What is this all about, Father? I'm a very busy man. Mr. Gull has an office on Jongler Street, just below Henri's photographic studio. He was always busy, although he no longer practiced medicine, at least not upon the locals. I disregarded the speculative look he gave Bonnie and explained our problem. Gull stared at me over steepled fingers. Why should this concern me? I need an insight into her psyche. I need someone with experience. Bonnie snorted. As opposed to, say, a woman? Sir William was physician in ordinary to Her Majesty the Queen, I replied, not shifting my eyes from the doctor's measured gaze. He was also the world authority on the treatment of badness in women, and the first man to accurately diagnose epilepsy. Not to mention his studies into the occult. He is well placed, believe me. Gull harumphed and rose from his chair, walking around the room with slow, steady steps. I no longer consult. You know that. I do. Why not? Bonnie asked. Because I have no need to. Sir William is interested in transubstantiation. I did my best to keep my voice neutral, especially the transformation of female flesh into something else. Something higher, father. Gull crossed the room to gaze up at a Walter Sickett portrait of Victoria. Her Majesty was a remarkable woman, both mystically powerful and troubled. She foresaw her death and knew it would herald the death of the Empire. I was charged with finding a way to transform her into something higher, more permanent. Five prostitutes died. They were transubstantiated, Father, ennobled, as was Her Majesty, in the end. Wait a minute! Bonnie strode past me to confront the heavy-set surgeon. Queen Victoria? But that was... A lifetime ago. No more. She turned to me, throwing her arms wide in exasperation. This is too much. It's just too much. Globs has made our people. Pictures coming to life and attacking me. Now ageless doctors from a hundred and forty-odd years ago. She made for the door. I can't take this. I came here for a holiday. Two weeks in the sun, that's all. Bonnie, I placed a hand on her shoulder and let a small portion of my being flow through my skin into her. She stiffened, turning wild eyes upon me. I understand your fear, but this is very real and very urgent. Leave if you want to, but I cannot guarantee your safety. She has seen you. Gull advanced upon us. Bonnie raised her head to him. I removed my hand as she sagged against me. Five prostitutes, she whispered. Five martyrs, he replied, reaching out to wipe away the tears that sprung to her eyes. 
and I have changed so very much since that time. You're? I am a surgeon, young lady, nothing more. Gull contemplated the portrait for long, silent seconds. I sensed the loneliness in him, and the soundless apologies he sent towards the painting subject. I wondered what they had to say to each other, in the evenings, when the two of them were alone and she could climb down from a frame in safety. Eventually he bowed his head and turned back to me, his eyes full of memory. This woman, father. Yes? She seeks to reclaim someone, a male. If she's been transformed and comes back, it is because she cannot be complete without him. Who? The baby, perhaps? Or the lover? Both, if necessary. I looked into his steady, knowing gaze and felt a hidden weight shift within me. Do you think you might know who, father? Yes, I whispered. Yes. There is a small room towards the back of my house, at the end of a corridor that appears only when it is absolutely unavoidable. I keep my items of pain there, all the mistakes and evils I cannot rectify and cannot bear to keep within me. I place my hand on the door and turn to my two companions. Please wait in the kitchen. They left. I close my eyes and open the door, stepping into the dark interior. No light infiltrates the room. It isn't necessary. I can find what I want without illumination. Directly inside on the top shelf lay a pine box, exactly twenty-four inches long by eight wide. I lifted it down with both hands and made my way to my companions. The door locked itself fast behind me, as it always does, until I need it again. What is it? Henri asked as I placed the box gently on the kitchen table. I prized the lid off and gazed down at the tiny figure within. My son, I said, allowing pain to fill me. Bonnie choked back a sob and began to whisper a prayer in Latin. Henri simply stared, his fingers turning white as they gripped the edge of the table. Joan wasn't hanged for being female, I said, reaching into the casket and gently raising out the body. She was a good pope. The people loved her. She was on the verge of heralding a new era of papal responsibility, widening the church's influence in areas that were significant in the coming dark ages. She was an efficient administrator, incorruptible, holy in every thought and deed. I nestled my son against my chest, stroking his mummified brow as I talked. Those in power knew she was a woman and didn't care. Joan was good for the church. Even when she secretly wed a member of her staff and became pregnant, they reordered their calendar to accommodate it. The mother of the church, becoming the mother of a child. It was a second coming of sorts, a symbol to unite the people under God. A perfect union of faith, humanity and motherhood. But, Henry choked, but she gave birth a month early, on her way through the streets of Rome, and she gave birth to this. I ran my fingers over my son's horns, down across the scales on his body, along the tail to its forked point. My son, I don't, I don't get it. Her body rejected him, I think. I looked up from his wizened visage. Joan was the personification of God upon earth. She had transubstantiated. Her husband wasn't evil, but his flesh came from an evil source. She could no longer bear it inside her, so she simply rejected him. This is the reason she was hanged. I held him out to them. This is what she's come back to claim. But that was over a thousand years ago. Bonnie gasped, her eyes fixed on the baby. Who are you? What are you? She backed away from me, stumbling as she banged into a stool. I spoke as gently as I can. I am old. I'm trying to be wise. I'm much better than I was. Oh, God, you're... you're the... No, I said, reading the conclusion in her eyes. I'm not him. He wouldn't even consider himself my father. I'm a part that was lost. That's all. No, she retreated to the door. No! She flung it open, running into the street. Bonnie! I turned to Henry. Follow her, please. Make sure she's okay. She'll need your protection. Henri moved past me, turning at the door to view me with more tiredness than fear. What about you? he said. Shouldn't you go after her? 
I have things I need to do, I replied, holding my son close. The hallway of Mama Kasson's hotel lay quiet around me as I carried my tiny burden to her apartment. The charm was still twisted around the doorknob. I placed my ear against the door but heard nothing from within. I'd be terrified if it wasn't for the fear, I muttered in my best Hawkeye Pierce voice, and loosened the charm. I dropped it into a jacket pocket, pushed open the door, and stepped through in one swift movement. Only once I was fully inside did I let go of the breath I was holding. The room was dark, the rubble of Joan's frenzied attack visible only by the glow emanating from a figure hanging in the air three feet in front of me. She glared at me from a twisted caricature of the face I once cradled in my hands, her eyes elongated slits of hatred and need. She raised her hands towards me, and they stretched into claws more avian than human. I returned the gesture, showing her the baby. They salted his flesh, I said. After they took him, they quartered him and salted him and took the parts to four pagan countries and buried him in the ground they decreed could never be consecrated. Joan floated down and placed her claws beneath my hands. I withdrew them, and my son stayed where he was, supported by ectoplasm and his mother's desperate love. It took me six hundred years to find him, I whispered. But I did, in the end. She drew her eyes away from his body. Iridescent tears streamed down her cheeks. Her lips twitched, and she mouthed the name I've not owned in over a millennia. Then she drew the little corpse up, nestling him against her breast in an unearthly parody of a feeding embrace. With her free hand, she reached out to stroke my cheek. I was surprised to find it wet. I'm sorry, I said. I never wanted to. No! Joan's attention snapped from me to the door. She flew back across the room with an enraged hiss. Get away from him! I turned to see Bonnie outlined in the doorway. Bonnie, don't! She stepped forward as I spoke, fists raised in the beginning stance of a Jeet Kune Do expert. As she crossed the threshold, Mama Kasson's protection spell activated, lifting her and flinging her backwards. She struck the wall outside the apartment with a wet thud and hung there, three feet above the floor. I moved on impulse, diving out the door, shouting an anti-spell in an effort to free her. I heard a shriek behind me. Bonnie began to slide down the wall. Joan swept past me, engulfing Bonnie's helpless form with her own. Bonnie screamed, and I joined in. I clawed at her waist, trying to pull her away from the maddened form of my former love. She turned to jelly as I watched, voice cutting off as her body transformed into a shapeless blob of flesh. It hit the floor with a soft plop. Joan spared me a single glance before swooping down the hallway and into the sky beyond, leaving me kneeling, Bonnie's cooling corpse in my arms, crying out her name until my voice gave way to helpless tears. Henri was waiting for me when I returned to my house. How did it... What's wrong? Go to Benito's, I told him, pushing past and striding into the kitchen. I want a bottle of his best red. His best, you understand, the stuff laid down in the bomb shelter he doesn't think anyone knows about. Here. I pulled a handful of coins from my jacket pocket and threw them on the bench. Go quickly. He'll take the balloons? Henri. I turned my back on him and let a little anger creep into my voice. Go now. Tell him there's another globster at Mama's for his cool room. I... Yes, Father. The door clicked shut and I went to work. Within an hour, I was ready and waiting for Henri's return. There was a knock, and the young photographer stepped through, a bottle of wine in his hand. I've got the... What the...? Deep in the bowels of the house, I have a cabinet full of candles. Each century, I make another set, imbuing them with the essence of the most potent experiences of the last hundred years. If lit, they cast shadows in such a way that the memories are released and fill the room. A dozen such candles circled the kitchen. Henri stood in the gilded doorway of the private dining quarters of Pope Joan VIII, the night she and I first made love. I sat at the small dining table, my simple cassock tight and itchy across my chest. Thank you, Henri. Leave the bottle with me, please. He crossed the room in amazement, circling slowly in an attempt to take everything in. How? I mean, what is this place? How did you... She has her child now. I concentrated on the ball of calm that sits within my chest whenever I'm about to reach an end that will leave me altered. A child needs a father. 
A wife needs her husband. What are you going to do? Transformations, Henri. We all need to change, to reach higher states of being. If we don't, we stand still or, worse, regress. If we regress, we die. I reached my jacket pocket and remembered my simple robes and crossed to the sideboard to retrieve a corkscrew. I bent to the bottle, releasing the cork with a satisfied grunt. She's coming. You should leave. I... yeah, okay. Henri made for the door. He opened it and glanced back at me. Good luck, father. Goodbye, Henri. He left, and I waited for the arrival of my lost love. I didn't wait for long. She was before me within minutes, glowing blue in the dark light of the candles. She was dressed as I best remembered her, in the cotton shift she favoured in her private apartments. Her hair was tied in an uncomplicated bun, a single flower tucked behind her ear. Her neck spoiled the illusion. It twisted to one side, her head tilted at an angle only achievable by a hangman's noose. Even in death, even with her child returned to her, she could not move past that moment. Lady, I bowed my head toward the bottle. Will you join me? She floated to the chair opposite. I poured two glasses and pushed one in front of her. Your health. I raised my glass and sipped. Joan placed a ghostly hand around her own glass and it glided up toward her mouth. I watched the wine drip down her throat, as well as the stream that crossed her angled cheek to spill upon the tablecloth. I stood and moved to the sideboard. Two plates lay upon it, next to a bowl of fresh vegetables and a small cut of dark meat. I filled each plate with thin slices. I placed one plate in front of Joan, turning it so the meat was closest. Then I regained my seat, speared a slice, and brought it to my lips. To our son, I said, and ate. Joan acknowledged my toast, then raised a sliver to her own mouth. She chewed and swallowed. The little ball fell down her throat until it reached the hangman's bend. Then it lodged. Joan swallowed, and again, but the meat remained stuck. Interesting cut, don't you think? I asked. Joan stared at me with bugged eyes, hands clawing at the obstruction. I found it, eventually, in a box buried in a garden in the courtyard of the Emperor's Palace in Tokyo. It was guarded by a small Shinto spirit called into being for that exact purpose. It's heart, my lady. Your son's heart. Very gently I placed my cutlery on the table and left my seat and walked round so that I stood with my hands on the back of her chair. I leaned forward, closed my eyes, and whispered, A devil's choice, don't you think? The meat will poison you, spirit that you are, if you leave it there, or you can reject it, spit it out, but you'll need to become flesh to do that. Either way, you will be transformed. I kissed her ear, feeling the electric tingle of her substance beneath my lips. Or shall it be, my love? She said nothing in response, merely stiffened as realisation of her position deepened. I kept my eyes closed, trying to remember the way Bonnie smelled, the way Mama Casson's hips swayed as she walked. The room began to grow cold. Matter is energy condensed into a slow-moving form. A spirit is a being of energy. It can become flesh again. All it takes is will and chemical change. I stood silent in the midst of Joan's endothermic reaction until she bucked forward and I heard choking erupt from the flesh of a newly substantial throat. I saw Bonnie's screaming face in my mind, saw the indisputable fact of Mama's transformation on the microscope slide, watched the images melt and run down into the ball of calm at my centre. Then I reached out and enclosed Joan's throat with my fingers. I shall never stop taking revenge. I squeezed until my knuckles throbbed, until the last feeble struggle died away beneath my hands, and I stood alone in the room with only my own steady breathing for company. I buried them at the top of point arrival. Four graves, one smaller than the rest, each marked with a single millennium-old candle. When the task was done, I sat in a rug and drank a final cup of coffee from my thermos. I overturned the rest and let the hot fluid run into the grass. Henri was waiting for me at the bottom of the incline. 
Are you okay? No. Are you going to be? That remains to be seen. I drew a small vial of smoke from a jacket pocket, uncorked it, and spread the contents around. The language I spoke is so old the only words remembered are those of that spell, and then only by me. Point arrival shimmered and disappeared. By the time the smoke cleared, no sign of the spur remained. A small beach stood in its place, easily accessible to all. Henri exhaled deeply. One thing I don't understand. Yes? What was Mama C doing on the beach? And why didn't anyone notice? I turned away from his questions. I don't know. What? I'm not perfect, I know. I'm only human. His gaze flickered down my length, the look on his face telling me all I needed to know about his opinion on that matter. Finally he shrugged and changed the subject. What about Bonnie's son? He'll be taken care of. I've made arrangements. The young photographer looked past me at the new beach, then up at the spot in mid-air where four graves deserved to be. You frighten me sometimes, you know. No more than I do myself. I walked away and took the long way back to town. This month's review book is The Library of Forgotten Books by Rurik Davidson. Rurik Davidson is a writer with a unique voice, at once romantically yearning and darkly insecure. His work straddles the deep contradictions of the human spirit, transporting the reader into a symbolic dream space where the hopes and fears of his protagonists play out. A welcome addition to UK firm PS Publishing's showcase series is Rurik's debut collection, The Library of Forgotten Books, containing six stories, four of which are previously unpublished. The majority of the stories are set in Rurik's Kalia Moore universe, which saw the light of day with Rurik's story The Passing of the Minotaurs, published in 2005. Kalia Moore is a Byzantine world with competing houses using strange mixtures of physics, botany and magic in their struggle for dominance, while the everyday people just try to get by without getting caught up in their deadly machinations. With four Kalia Moore stories appearing together, I get the feeling that we're reaching a critical creational mass. It's a great thing to see to be able to watch an imaginary world being constructed around you, and the stories in this collection, as well as delivering engaging tales with equal measures of humanity and weirdness, do just that, and demonstrate that Kelly Amour has the potential to be a richly detailed and exciting world, with many more tales to tell than the ones contained here. The other two stories, The Cinema of Coming Attractions and Int Morg Night, share a common link with a distinctly filmic feel. The second, being a Marlowe-esque homage, is the weaker of the two. This is ground that has been well trodden and it's difficult to breathe new life into it. But the cinema of coming attractions works on so many levels, it's a triumph. A riff on determinism with people who seem as trapped as the celluloid characters they are so reminiscent of, speaking lines that similarly are almost deadened of all meaning, but still hoping, still trying. It's a story that stays with you long after the final fade-out. The Library of Forgotten Books is a startling new collection from a writer to watch. Four and a half stars. The Library of Forgotten Books is published in Australia by PS Publishing. You have been listening to Terra Incognita Australian Speculative Fiction Podcast. Visit tisf.com.au for links to the featured author's websites and for details of the publications. Stories are copyright by the author. Book reviews are copyright Keith Stevenson, 2010. This podcast is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 Australian license. See our website for details. Please tune in next month for another podcast of the best Australian speculative fiction 
read by the authors who created it.